Right, hello, it's the ninth episode in the Century Ecology series and today we're going to look at, very simple title, we're going to look at eyes and the diversity of eyes in nature. Now, we obviously have two eyes, but if you look elsewhere in the animal kingdom, particularly the arthropods, they have more than two eyes, okay? Each of our eyes has one lens, so we have two lenses in total, but that is not the case for invertebrates. The record is in a species of dragonfly which has 25,000 different lenses. Okay, and we're going to look into a lot more detail on how all that works later in the video. But that's giving you some perspective. There's huge diversity here. Okay, and as we'll explain later, the resolution of the vertebrate eye is much greater than that of the insect eye. But anyway, we don't need to worry about that for the moment. We're going to start off by looking at some of the imperfections of the eye. Now, you might think. You know, a lot of creationists argue, I'm not going to go into that too much, but a lot of creationists argue, you know, the eye is such a perfect, complicated structure. How on earth could it evolve? Blah, blah, blah. Well, the truth is that the eye isn't perfect. It's got loads of imperfections that uh, mean it doesn't work as well as it could have done, right? For a start, the eye requires oxygen, right? Oxygen travels in the blood. So you've got loads of blood vessels going to the eye. And these blood vessels which feed the sensitive parts of the eye interfere with light perception a little bit. So let's look at a diagram of the vertebrate eye then to give us some perspective of what's going on. So in the retina, as we spoke about two episodes ago, that's where all the photoreceptive cells are, the rods and the cones. But there is a major, major flaw here. Because if you look, <laughs> the photoreceptors are pointing in the opposite direction to where the light is coming from. What the hell is that all about? Now obviously those rods and cones are connected to neurons, which we'll look into a lot more detail later. So because they're connected to neurons, those, any light that comes in um, through um, the vertebrate eye has to get through the network of neurons before it reaches the photoreceptors, okay? Imagine that, imagine if someone designing a camera, yeah, designed the camera perfectly, but put the photoreceptors facing in the wrong direction, well then they'd get the sack immediately, wouldn't they? And that also means, well all those networks of neurons coming in, think of them as wires, well they've got to come out somewhere, and they come out through the optic nerve, as you can see there. Now the optic nerve, because it's like a, a hole, if you like, doesn't have any photoreceptors in it. So that is what we call the blind spot, because there's no photoreceptors to pick up light which um, lands at that particular point. Our brains have to correct for that because our eyes are constantly vibrating in their sockets, so we, bring, we build up a virtual picture of the world. Okay, so luckily our brains have got it sorted, but the main point is here that the eye is far from perfectly designed. Now having another look at that diagram then, we can see the fovea centralis is the centre of the optic axis of the eye. That's where most of the photoreceptors are. Okay, now receptor packing in the retina isn't uniform. As there's more colour vision receptors, near the fovea, so that means there's more cones near the fovea centralis. But as you go, move towards the periphery, you begin to see more and more rods, okay? So that means the fovea centralis isn't that good at night vision, for example, because that contains all the cone receptors. For night vision, you really want rods, just so you're able to just detect light. 
The overall density of the photoreceptors also decreases as you move away from the fovea centralis. It's something like 160,000 photoreceptive cells per square millimetre in the fovea centralis. It becomes much less than that as you move further away towards the periphery. In the fovea centralis, there's also something which we call the yellow spot. Okay, and we call it the yellow spot it's because there's very few blue receptors there, blue cone receptors. And that is thought um, to act as um, a protection to the fovea centralis from UV radiation. Obviously, UV and blue light are relatively close together compared to the red and green photoreceptors, so that's probably why there's less of them near the fovea centralis, at the centre of the optical axis, which we need to protect because that's a really important part of the eye. So as I said, the true image which you're seeing right now is integrated by the brain by these sort of individual snapshots, if you like, taken by the eye. So it's very, very clever, really. Now with more cones, that means there's a greater resolution, a greater visual acuity, if you want to be technical. Now, the distribution of cones in several vertebrates differs. Because, for example, a sheep, right, has horizontal high resolution, but also in the dorsal temporal part of the retina, which is just above. Now, to have a horizontal line of resolution, that's particularly useful, when you're a grazing animal and you've got eyes on either side of your head, right? So that means you can detect predators a lot more easily on the horizon, okay? So you can f go run away quickly. But also, it allows you, for having the dorsoventral um, area of high resolution, also allows you to look forward as well. So this sheep can look in all different directions with high visual acuity. That's the same if you're a predator, of course. If you're looking for prey, and this has been shown in the spotted hyena. Canada geese, on the other hand, have a tilted visual streak, so it sort of goes diagonally. And why is that? Well, that's to compensate for their head movements during flight. Right? So every aspect of the eye has been tuned to that animal's behaviour and ecology, so it can see what it wants to see, basically. Um, I said about the Canada geese, it's also been observed and measured in albatross as well, which of course fly quite a lot as well. They're quite big flying animals, aren't they? Many raptors, so birds of prey, also have what we call a double fovea, okay? So that means they've got two concentrations, two high concentrations of photoreceptive cone cells. Okay, so that means if you look at an eagle or something, if it's looking that way, it can see you. If it's looking that way, it can see you as well. So that's the vertebrate eye then. That can just be considered as a single lens which converges light onto a single point on the, on the retina. Okay, and what's interesting is that image projected onto the retina is actually a mirror image. Okay, so you see upside down. So light coming in this way will hit that part of the retina and light coming in this way will hit that part of the retina. So it will be inverted. So it's actually your brain that turns the image that you see the right way up. Now the invertebrate on the other hand is a completely different kettle of fish. As I mentioned earlier, they have what we call a compound eye made up of loads of individual lenses called omatidia. So here there's no mirror image or anything like that. Now, one important thing that we need to um, discuss here is this idea of angular resolution, okay? That's the angle that two points need to be apart for you to distinguish between the two, okay? To, you know, so you realise that there's two points there. Now, I've got some statistics here. As you can see, a human, their angular resolution is 0 0.4, okay? And that of a fly is 540. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that the angular resolution of a human is much, much better than that of a fly. And to calculate this, the angle, which we call alpha, has to be measured between two photoreceptors that are next to each other. So it's a bit oh, technical, but, um, you know, rather them do it and not me, eh? <laughs> because... Because these lenses are so small, it limits the amount of light which can enter. Okay, and that, as a result, will affect the resolution of the image that you see. 
Now there's another term that we need to get to grips with and that is sensitivity. Now that's the probability of an eye absorbing a photon of light. Okay, now there are loads and loads of things which can affect the, that probability. Obviously you want to have an increased sensitivity to light as it's most sensitive as it can possibly be. So there are loads of things you can do to increase that sensitivity. So you can affect the density and the length of the photopigment. If you've got more photopigment there, then there's a greater chance that a photon will be absorbed. And the length, well, if you've got a long tube full of photoreceptive pigment, that's going to have a greater chance of absorbing a photon than the short tube. Okay? You don't have to be Einstein to work that one out. You can also affect receptor diameter, okay? How big your lens is, how big the aperture is, basically. And you see that in loads of nocturnal animals, they tend to have a greater diameter, a greater receptor diameter. You can also actively change the length of your photoreceptor. And this was shown by Menzi et al. in 1986 on ants, where at night, the length of the photoreceptor increased. Now another key thing is this thing called the tapetum lucidum. Now you would have experienced the effect of the tapetum lucidum if you've ever been looking for animals at night, okay? And you've got a torch and the best way to look for animals at night is to look for eye shine, yeah? Loads of animals do it, most nocturnal animals do it. And that's all down to the tapetum lucidum. The tapetum lucidum is basically a mirror. Now, usually light is absorbed by certain cells called pigment cells, and that's to reduce the glare um, received by the eye. But in nocturnal animals, what you often see is that actually goes away, and you actually have a silvery layer. So that means light which enters can be reflected back, and then back at the photoreceptors again. So it's like the light has been given a second chance, because if it reaches the tapetum lucidum, that means the photoreceptors haven't absorbed it, so it gets reflected back and bounces back for another go. That's clever. And it's because of that that we get eye shine when we look for those animals at night. And this tapetum lucidum is made up of guanine crystals, which are very silvery-like. Another thing you can do is increase the eye aperture. Okay, so the iris opening and closing, letting more or less light in. That's pretty obvious as well, isn't it? Now we've talked a lot about trade-offs in this series, and this is a pretty important one. It's a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity. Because the greater the resolution, that usually means the lower the sensitivity, and vice versa. Okay, so these animals have to reach a Goldilocks amount of the two, so it's just right for them. Right, there are three different types of compound eye in invertebrates. We're going to go through them all, using diagrams obviously, because we've realised that I can't draw, um, and see if we can make head or tail of them. Right, so the first one is the apposition compound eye. Now this is pretty much your standard compound eye. Most um, arthropods have this type of eye. And the important point to note is that there's good resolution, but poor sensitivity. So there are various bits of anatomy that we need to know here. The first thing at the top, obviously, is the lens, which is then followed by the crystalline cone, which directs the light into the channel where all the photoreceptor cells are, and that area is called the rhabdom. Okay, and they contain um, photoreceptive cells which have loads of microvilli, and it's in the microvilli where the photoreceptive pigments are. Okay, we'll have a closer look at that in a second and how exactly those photoreceptive cells are arranged. Now, as you can see, either side of the crystalline cone are these cells called pigment cells, and they absorb the light. It's what I was talking about earlier in reference to the tapetum lucidum. They absorb light, so that means light can't leak out into the um, omatidia next door, okay? Because that would disrupt the visual perception of whatever animal it is, okay? So due to there being no leakage of light, and that each rhabdom is served by one lens, 
that means we can say that this eye has a pretty good resolution. But because these omatidia are pretty small, not much light can enter each one. So that means, as a result, they have a poor sensitivity. Okay? So that's it. The apposition compound eye has good, pretty good resolution, but bad sensitivity. But it does give a pretty crisp image. Okay, so the superposition compound eye then. Now the main difference here is that there's a clear zone. So that means light can be focused from several lenses onto a single rhabdon. Now another difference is that there's no pigment cells here to absorb the light. So that means there's more light leakage than in the apposition compound eye. Yeah, so that leads to a less of a crisp image. But, it means you have a much more sensitive eye now because you've basically increased the aperture because lots of light from loads of different lenses, loads of different facets, are feeding in to a single rhabdome. They're all converging on a single rhabdome. So more light is entering, so there's a greater chance of photons being absorbed. And the resolution of these eyes are pretty good as well. But as I said before, the light leakage that we see due to the lack of pigment cells leads to a bit of a blurred image here. But it's still pretty good. It's used by a lot of nocturnal insects due to this high sensitivity. Now, until very recently, we thought these were the only types of compound eye in nature. But it turns out that wasn't the case. There's another one, the neural superposition eye. But to understand that, we need to know more about the anatomy of each of the omatidia. Now in insects there are eight photoreceptive cells in each omatidium. Right? And I mentioned earlier that they have loads of microvilli which is where the photopigment is. Now the way they're arranged in the rhabdom is particularly important. They're arranged perpendicularly to each other. So these retinular cells face into the rhabdom, intercalated with each other, and because of that, that creates a canal for light to move down. The thing with the neural superposition eye is that, unlike in the others, where all eight photoreceptors are found in one omatidium, this is no longer the case. In this eye, each omatidium has a specific type of photoreceptor, and it's surrounded by omatidia which contains different photoreceptors. So every photoreceptor is looking out through a different lens and this gives incredible resolution, incredible sensitivity and a crisp image. And this is due to no optical interference because you've got the pigment cells there. And there are two different types, two different types. There's one to six which is to detect low intensity light and seven plus eight which is high intensity. Okay, don't worry too much about that. And the only animals that these have been observed in so far are in flies, so they're thought to be pretty unique to Diptera. Okay, now let's start looking into the neurobiology of all of this then. So as I mentioned before, these photoreceptive cells are connected to neurons. More specifically, the first neuron they encounter is a bipolar neuron, right, bipolar neuron. And that bipolar neuron is then connected to a ganglion. And that ganglion cell connects to, eventually, the optic nerve. Okay. Now there are also these things called horizontal cells which create this um, phenomena of lateral inhibition. And we'll see why that's important in a second. Now what's interesting is that about photoreceptive cells is they do completely opposite to what you'd expect. And I think we mentioned this two episodes ago. So when light enters it causes a hyperpolarization of the cell, not a depolarization. Okay, so the inside of the cell is made more negative than it was before. Now, on the bipolar cells, there can be this thing called the metabotropic glutamate receptor. Okay, and if you have a metabotropic glutamate receptor, that will cause a depolarization in the bipolar neuron. This then leads to further action potentials in the ganglia and then eventually in the optic nerve, so a signal is transmitted. However, if a bipolar neuron has an ionotropic 
glutamate receptor, then it hyperpolarizes. To demonstrate the relevance of this, here's a picture. So just focus on that for a second. Now you should be able to see black dots in each of the corners, right? Now if you look at that properly, they're clearly not really there. So what on earth is going on? So we're going to try and explain that using what we've learned. Now, I said I'd given up doing diagrams, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't resist doing this one. So you've got light. These three cells here are the photoreceptive cells, the cones if you like. So light's coming in here. And at the bottom here, we've got ganglion cells. Now what's important is that more than one ganglion cell can connect with more than one photoreceptive cell. And some of these cells are fed with on or off signals. The on signals being from the metabotropic um, receptors and the off sig signals being from the ionotropic receptors. What does that mean? Well, let's say light's coming in here, hitting the middle photoreceptor. Well, that's going to set off a metatropic uh, bipolar neuron, which is then connecting to this ganglion here. However, it also sets off an ionotropic bipolar neuron, which sends an off signal to the ganglion cell next door. Okay, and also to the one on the other side of that. Okay, now let's imagine theoretically that light is only hitting this photoreceptor. That's extremely unlikely because obviously these photoreceptors are very close together. But let's think about that for a second. Well, that means these two ganglion cells are going to receive... Um, an off signal, and this one is going to receive an on. So that means that that ganglion cell is going to receive a maximum contrast. It's increasing the contrast. We've seen that a lot in this series already. If light hitting all three photoreceptors, well then obviously we'll get something like this. So you get on signals there, and then you'll get off signals either way. So everything kind of cancels out. Yeah? Like that. And they'll go to the ganglion cells next to them as well. Due to this suppression effect, the effect of lateral inhibition, then we have what we call contrast enhancement. Okay? Now going back to that diagram, well, the, the picture that I showed you, well, what you see is that if you make the rows thinner, the white rows, then the effect is less impressive. You don't see it so well. So why is that? Now that's all to do with your receptive field. And the receptive field is all the photoreceptors projecting onto a ganglion cell. And this is all given by this funky equation here. Now DRF stands for the diameter of the receptive field. Okay, so that basically stands for itself. Now there are different types of receptive field. There's extrafovial receptive fields, which I think basically stand for themselves. And then there's foveal receptive fields, which of course only involve cone cells because there's only cone cells in the fovea centralis. Okay. Now in the foveal receptor field, that usually only involves one receptor, so it's a bit more simple. And seeing as though in that Herman grid we showed you, it was in black and white, we're using our extra foveal um, receptive fields here. It's because of this one-to-one -one reaction that we see in the foveal receptive field, which is why if you directly look at one of those corners on that Hermann grid, the effect disappears completely. You realise that it's white. So it's all in your peripheral perception, this. So this all means that if the receptive field is smaller than the length of the rows, those white rows, then you just won't see effect, an effect. Okay? Because you need an overlap. You need that lateral inhibition. Because if the size of your receptive field means you're only seeing one colour, then, well, light's constant then, isn't it? There's no on-off interactions, just like in this diagram which I've shown you here. If light's projected on all three photoreceptors, then you'll get the same response. The inhibitions 
and the reinforcements cancel each other out. So that's all a bit of a fun experiment, but the ideas of receptive fields are clearly very, very important in our study of visual ecology and the sensitivity and the resolution of the different eyes that we've been talking about. Okay, so that's me done. Next time we'll be looking more into eyes, more specifically um, binocular vision and colour vision and the evolution of it. Okay, I'll see you next time.